All right, raise your hand if your, reven if your firm's revenues are less than $500,000. Raise your hand if your firm's revenues are less than $500,000. All right. Um, stand up if your revenues are less than $500,000. Stand up. Look around you. Look how few people are standing up with revenues less than $500,000. You know why there are so few people standing up with revenues less than $500,000? Someone with revenues less than $500,000, tell me why you think there are so few people standing up with revenues of less than $500,000. No, because they're not back in the fucking room. You starting to see the correlation? You can all sit down now. I want you to be proud of yourself, right? Because you're here, and I guess they're out looking at the lake. Like, that's going to give them the answer for how to double the revenues of their firm. I'm serious. You have to show up. You have to show up. You have to get it done. Everyone with revenues over a million dollars, would you just Give me an amen, but only if you really agree with this. And if you really agree with this, the more you agree with this, the more rowdy I want your amen to be. You all understand what I'm saying? Amen. You haven't heard what I said yet. <laughs> the hardest part of building a million dollar law firm is just fucking doing it. There's no big secrets. Amen. To the extent that there's any secrets you need to know, we already are going to tell you what to do. Amen. And if you'll just do it, it works because it works and it works. Amen. All right. So now, Look around, and you see, the reason that most law firm owners don't have a half a million dollar firm, don't have a million dollar firm, the reason that their firms don't grow by more than like the industry average. You know how much the average small law firm in this country grows? For anyone who hasn't heard me say this a hundred times before, please don't answer. Um, for everyone else, the average small law firm in this country grows at 5% per year. That's pathetic. That's really, truly sad and pathetic. I mean that sincerely. Like, that's sad and pathetic from a human suffering standpoint. That's sad and pathetic from a, all the clients whose lives aren't being helped standpoint. That's sad and pathetic from the, the lessons they're teaching their children about what you should tolerate and put up with instead of just building the life you want to live standpoint. From every, state, every way you can think, at it, think about it, it's just sad. We don't have all our FTC data all assembled yet. We're working on that. Um, but I can tell you anecdotally, in an FTC compliant, non whatever kind of way, who does FTC work? Anyone? All right, in an FTC compliant, anecdotal way, I'll just say, good luck finding anyone in this room who's been working with us for more than a couple of years whose firm isn't growing at least 20, 30, 40 percent year on year on year. And it's not because we teach you some magical thing. We just help you get it done. And to get it done, you have to show up. All right. Now, I'm going to summarize the main points for the automatic referral machine that we've been teaching you how to build. And then after I summarize these main points, I've asked a whole group of people with a firm that's grossing more than a million and a half dollars a year, I'm going to ask them to just let you know where their firm was a few years ago where their firm is right now, 
and whether they think that if you will just do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, you can, in fact, double the revenues of your $200,000 firm or double the revenues of your $300,000 firm or double the revenues of even your $500,000 firm in about 12 to 18 months. And you can hear it from them because I'm really afraid that you're going to walk out of here and not do it because you just keep hearing it from me. All right? So here it is. Three things to do. One engineering a uh, referral client appreciation conversation systematically into every case closing. At the end of every case, at the end of every matter, when you reach that milestone point to say to the client, now that you've reached this milestone point in your life, because you've gotten divorced, because you've gotten your final discharge, because you've finally filed your uh, patent, even if it hasn't been approved yet, but now you can share it with the world, in other words. Now that you've gotten your settlement check, now that you've got your estate plan done, now that you've got exonerated from your criminal defense charges, whatever, 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 now that we've reached this milestone point in your life, we'd like to talk to you about all the things that we know from experience people go through and the challenges they face and the opportunities that they are trying to encounter, uh, that they're trying to take advantage of because we know better than you because this is your first divorce. This is your first criminal defense. This is your first bankruptcy. This is your first immigration. This is your first estate plan. This is your first time buying or selling a business. This is your first time you filed a patent, whatever, whatever, whatever. This is the first time you've done it and we are professionals and so we know better. And so rather than letting you grope by blindly into the future, we're going to guide you through this process because we give a shit about you and engineer that into every single case or matter closing. Point number one of your, ref of your automatic referral machine. Point number two, uh, connecting people who should know each other. Connecting people who should know each other, organizing a monthly standing lunch. Could it be a breakfast? Yes, it could be a breakfast. Could it be a lot dinner? Yes, it could be a dinner. Does it have to be at the Ritz Carlton? No, it does not. Could it be at the Denny's? I would recommend you don't do it at the Denny's. <laughs> All right? Find a restaurant you like and you call, you have someone from your office, because I know you won't do it. Call the people who you want to refer business to you. Call the people who you think could and should refer business to each other, and you say to them, uh, I'd like to invite you to a lunch because I want to introduce you to some people who I think you should know. These are people who I think you might be able to do business with. These are people just in our local business community who I think you should know, and I'd like to introduce you to them. Would you join me for lunch? Look for a... Uh, invita a formal invitation in the mail or go and RSVP right now and join me for the lunch. And then you contact the owner of the restaurant, you contact the manager of the restaurant and you say, I'd like to have a standing appointment at your restaurant every month with a table and I want to have your best server and I want to prepay and I want to pre-tip and I want to come down there and, 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 and have you treat me and my guests really well and at the end of the meal, I want you to give everyone a gift certificate for your restaurant for $25, $50, whatever, and I'm gonna pay for it so that not only will they have a great experience with me, but then they'll come back to your restaurant again. And then you play the connector and you bring everyone to that meal and you just introduce each other and show them how they could or should be doing business together or why it would be good for them to know each other. Make sense? Yeah. All right. We'll talk about national, nationwide, nationwide firms later. Start off just locally. You are in New York City. You got plenty of people you can bring together in the city, all right? Point number three is writing thank you notes. 
did you receive my thank you note for being here? Yes. Who received the thank you note? Hold it up. Show the note. Show the note. Show the, did it look like that? Look at how many notes there are. Look at how many notes there are. It's not computer generated. It was written with a pen on a piece of paper. Were you holding it in your hand? Could you not tell that's real ink on a piece of paper? Yes. All right, play the video. figure out that handwritten note you got from me I didn't write it with my hand it was written by a robot and you probably thought it was written by hand because it was practically illegible in my trademark five-year-old handwriting um, but look you know you know you should be writing handwritten notes we all know we should be writing handwritten notes the rate making Rolodex is a proven money maker writing handwritten thank you notes top of mind awareness notes it's just it's been working for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to, 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 to generate referrals, maintain top of mind awareness, plus it's just a nice thing to do. But look, despite our best efforts, we just never get around to doing it. So how to manage, we've created a solution for you where we will make sure your handwritten notes get written to your referral sources every month, to your clients every month, so that your automatic referral machine starts working for you. All right, is anyone here generating consistently $5,000 an hour with anything you do? I mean, I do. Some of you are, right? Your revenues are under $250,000, write thank you notes, all right? You should never get off of an airplane. You should never check out of a hotel. You should never leave a meeting. You should never go through a day without finding someone to write a thank you note to or to write a congratulatory note about to their supervisor, yeah? You have a good experience at a restaurant. Dear owner of the restaurant, I wanna let you know that I had lunch at your restaurant yesterday, last week, whatever, and Joe was my server. I know you probably only get people who write when they have problems, but I wanna let you know I had a great experience. Joe treated us great, and I'll be proud to bring clients back to your restaurant. How do you think you're going to get treated the next time you go to that restaurant? Royalty. Like royalty. And you don't, conclude, you don't conclude it with, and by the way, I do immigration law, and if I could ever be of service to you. Don't do that. Don't be an amateur, right? Is this obvious? I mean, you get how this works? Yes? No? Has anyone never heard this idea before? None of your mothers ever taught you to write thank you notes? You all know this, right? Why don't, you, why don't you have those conversations with the prospective clients after every case? Because it's a big pain in the ass to do it, because everyone's busy, and you got to find someone on your staff to do it. Why don't you have the lunches? Because it's a big pain in the ass to do, and you got no one to organize it. Why don't you write the thank you notes? Because it's a big pain in the ass to do, and you know maybe you're shy. So, everyone whose revenues are less than $500,000, pay attention, all right? Because your big excuse for why you don't do this stuff is what? You don't have the time, and you don't have the money, and blah, 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 blah. All right, so, uh, let off, let's start off with Tom. Tom. If they have a firm that's under half a million dollars and they just do these three things, and these three things only, how much money are you spending on pay per click, everyone? 
Stop spending the money on pay-per-click. How much money are you spending on advertising? Stop. If they just did this, what do you think would happen to their $250,000 or $500,000 firm? They'd become five hundred dollars or a million dollars. All right. What will, be, what will be your opinion? Yeah, same. Oh, I'm sorry. You forgot to say, where were your revenues before? Where are your revenues now? Because you need to establish your credibility with everyone who's got a firm of less than $500,000, please. Sure. We do divorce law, and we were at 3.2, and this year we're doing 6.5. Where was your firm like five years ago? Uh, would it be 2017? Like 1.6. All right. So 1.6, and this year your firm will gross? 6.5. Six, six and a half million dollars. Yes. And you're telling everyone with a half a million dollar firm, a $250,000 firm, who doesn't have a giant marketing budget, that if they'll just do these three things, you think they could probably double their business? Absolutely. All right, next. Well, Where was your firm before? Where's your firm now? And what do you say to everyone who's got... By the way, you notice how long the line is? It's because I have to abuse this fucking point so you do it. I have to just abuse the point into you so you just, just, just fucking do it and stop making all these excuses for not doing it. Because it doesn't cost any money, just do it. I'm Eric Toscano, Tenant Law Group, San Francisco. I joined uh, How to Manage in uh, 2016, and our first year we did 265, and uh, this year we're gonna do two and a half. Million? Yes. Two and a half million? Two and a half million. And your advice to everyone who's got a, how much was your firm when you engaged our services? Well, it was new. But that first year, I did two sixty-five. Two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Yeah. Was your advice to everyone who has a two hundred sixty-five thousand dollar firm with regard to this simple, low cost, no cost, low tech, no tech, um, automatic referral machine plan? Do it. Because it works. All right, Francisco. Uh, Francisco Estate Planning in Chandler, and uh, this year we'll do two million. Um, we started in 2015 with how to manage and we did, well, the year before 2015, before we started, we did 300,000 and this is the marketing I wish I would have done at 300,000. Thank you. Holly. Uh, when I joined how to manage in 2017, I was doing about 250. This year we're going to do about 3.4 ish. Um, and I basically built my firm to about a million and a half by writing thank you notes. I don't know how anyone could forget my presentation for the best thing I did for my law firm in 2018, but if you have forgotten how amazing that was, go look at it. It was all about writing thank you notes. I didn't spend a dollar of, on anything marketing until about a million and a half dollars. Thank you. My name is McDaniel Reynolds with Reynolds Defense Firm in Portland, Oregon. We represent good people facing DUI charges, and I first met Arjan in 2012. Our revenue was about 400,000 then. I used much of what he's saying between 400 and 800,000 um, over the next two or three years, 2016 or so, 2014. Um, we're now uh, two point. We'll be 2.5 this year. So. And your advice to everyone whose fir whose revenues are, let's just call it 400,000 dollars. <laughs> just fucking do it, right? <laughs> Reach out to the people who who care enough to, 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 to talk to you, right? Talk them up, get to know them, invite them to coffee, even if you don't do a big formal dinner, but invite them to something, get them one-on-one -on -one time, get to know who they are, and then nurture that relationship without question. Awesome. Uh, Carrie. Carrie Schultz, Mr. Men's Rights, Divorce and Family Law. Let us be the bitch that handles yours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that happened over a margarita. So, um, okay, so when I joined How to Manage, actually, as I said, it was on the heels of this referral workshop, so I implemented. I walked into How to Manage by year's end at 662, and we are um, tracking to do 2.1, 2.2. I'm trying to squeeze it out. So. And your advice to everyone whose revenues are 200, 300, 400,000, even 100,000, even 50,000, even just getting started with no budget? Yeah, super easy. The connecting, the connector part is gold, gold. All right, thank you. Sharon? Oh, Francisco? I had to cut back because I realized what I really 
needed to hear back when I was a $300,000 firm or a $500,000 firm was to not waste my money on big marketing campaigns. Thank you. This is the marketing I should have put my time into. Thank you, Francisco. Sharon Ramage, uh, McKinney, Texas, Family Law. And I joined in 2015, and I was at about 600,000. And we're tracking 1.9 to 2 million this year. And um, I would say to everyone, just do it, especially if you're starting out, because it, it doesn't cost you anything, and you will see quick results. Thank you. John. John Risby, the patent professor. In 2017, we did 1.8 million. Uh, this year, we're going to do seven. Only about 20% of my uh, business comes from within the state of Florida. I'm in South Florida. Uh, but I'm definitely going to do this because even the 20%, if it goes up, especially most of the work's done by staff. So if I'm going to do it at, and only 20% of my work comes from the local business community, like if you have 100% of your work locally, absolutely do it. Hi, David Purvis with the Manili firm. We do all family law all around Georgia and all around the world. We joined in July of 2019. We did 2.4 million that year. We did 3.6 last year, so 50% increase, and they were on track for 5.2 this year, so about 45% increase. And what's your advice to everyone who's got a small firm, $100,000, $200,000, $500,000, and they're maybe spending three, four, five thousand dollars a month on PPC and all kinds of fancy schmancy stuff. And meanwhile, here's a marketing blueprint that they could do with low tech, no tech, low cost, no cost. The the most important thing I do are handwritten personal thank you notes to everybody who sends a, a potential client my way. Hands down. Awesome. And and do the work including the skew calculator. As much of a pain in the ass as that is. <laughs> okay. Just do it. Good. All right. Hi, I'm Tom Spiggle with the Spiggle Law Firm in Arlington, Virginia. We do plaintiff side employment. Um, I started with HTM in 2017. I was right around 700,000. We will close out this year at around 3.2 million. Um, my advice is to do uh, what I, not do what I did. Don't screw around early on with funnels and pay-per-click and Infusionsoft get Bob Berg's book, uh, Endless Referrals, and use the principles here, just do half of it, I could have cut the, the time it took me to get where I am now in half, easily. Excellent. Mickey Keenan, personal injury attorney, Tampa, Florida. We help accident victims get the money they deserve so they can get back to living. I joined uh, How to Manage 2019, making about a million dollars a year. Um, this year we're gonna gross about 3.5. I spend zero dollars on pay-per-click. I do have a website, and uh, but I spend no money on advertising. I just do this. It's a system. It works. It works for everybody. All I got to do is do it. Thank you, Josh. Josh Nelson from Nelson Elder Care Law. We're in the northwest suburbs of Atlanta, and we help protect your loved ones. Started in 2017. Actually, went to the referral workshop that Carrie went to. Didn't sign up. Didn't grow my business. Came back in 2017, sub 600, and we'll do over 4.3 this year, which is pretty big jump. But I have an excuse that he hasn't mentioned yet, which is my handwriting is illegible. I haven't seen you go after that one. And so my trick, what got me to where I'm going, is I hired somebody that writes those notes and signs my name, and it works. It's a $40,000 a year person. They take care of this. If you can hire away these things, that's like the best use of your time. Whenever I look at my work week now, even if I had better handwriting, I wouldn't take this back on. <laughs> who, who is this? Is this $40,000 person like a family member, a friend, someone you care personally about, like in, in a, like a personal way? No. <laughs> It, it, because, because maybe we need to play this video again. You didn't offer this back in 2017. Well, now we do. And there we go. All right. I want the machine. I can do all my stuff like this. And you know the coolest thing about it is? So listen, um, there, there's actually two ways you can get this service. One is I could just refer you directly to the company that does it, and they'll set you up with an app 
and you literally just type out on the app, and then the computer handwrites everything, addresses it, and then a human being takes it off the printer, folds it up, puts a real stamp on it, drops it in the mail, off it goes. Um, the service that we're providing is we will actually call you once a month and literally force you to give us people who we can write notes to for you. Like, we'll basically go through your calendar with you once a month and say, okay, are you on the 10 notes a month plan, on the seven month note plan, or on the three notes a month plan? And we'll say, okay, let's go through your calendar and find 10 people that we can write a note to. And we'll basically just interview you and extract it from you, and we'll click, 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 type it into the app for you, and then this company will mail it out for you. And they literally, the software learned your handwriting, and then they have artists who like basically take your handwriting samples and teach the software your handwriting. Now the reason why you got handwritten notes here instead of in the mail is because I now have the record. This company sends out 150,000 notes a month. And I now have the record of the worst handwriting they've ever seen. <laughs> and it took a team of their artists, not just one, three weeks instead of one week to teach the, to teach the computer my handwriting. Do they have a handwriting optimization option? Is it like a filter for my handwriting to make well, it better? I wanted it to look like my real handwriting. But if you wanted to have someone else's handwriting, that's even easier. It doesn't have to be like your handwriting. I wanted it to be my handwriting because I wanted to be able to prove to you guys that this is like real and authentic. My heart sunk whenever I found out you weren't slaving away on these. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry to disappoint you. All right, cool, thank you. April. Hi, Arjan. So April Jones, uh, Colorado Family Law. We help breaking families divide money, property, and children, and we're really good at it. So I started in uh, January 2019. Prior to that, I, our firm tended to grow seven something, 799, 701, 750, and hadn't broken the million dollar barrier ever, which is part of why I signed up. And so 2019, 20, uh, first year 2020 was 1.4. Second year was 2.4. This year should be 3.7, but we're on a 5 million plus run rate. Where's John Risby? Where's John Risby? There he is. John Risby. Wait, April. John Risby. April. What was your first year? 1.4. John Risby. 1.8. April, second year. 2.4. John Risby. 2.5. April, third year. 3.7. John Rizvi. 3.5. Six next year. <laughs> John. So, well, five and then seven this year. She's catching up on you. <laughs> Guys, these, these, these milestones of growth are very predictable. Zero to 250, boom. 250 to 500, boom. 500 to a million five, boom. Million five to around three million, boom. 3 million to about 5 million, boom. It just, it's very predictable how your law firms are going to grow if you run them the right way. All right, April, wait. Your advice to everyone with a revenue run rate of 100,000, 200, 300, 400, 500,000 ish about just implement this super simple, low cost, no cost, low tech, no tech, automatic referral marketing blueprint. Build your business with referrals. Do it, low cost, no cost. I built my business originally with referrals, which I kind of forgot about until you started talking today. Because um, you kind of get away from it, because you grow and you don't feel like you need it as much and you've got you know, all this electronic stuff. But the bread and butter, the hand over fist is referrals. So we're definitely going to be doing this program because I need to get you know, level over level. And so um, some free referrals would be very nice. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hope Spangler, Jarvis Law Office. We do elder law in Ohio. We joined in October 2018. 
we were at 2.1 million, we'll do three on a run rate for about three, five. Our advice is yes, pay attention to referrals um, and your current client base every year. About 35% of our revenue comes from client referrals and another good 20% or more from professional referrals. We do, we're horrible at thank you notes, Tim and I, um, but our staff write them. We also do random acts of kindness, which are um, modest but unique gifts based on very specific information that the clients or referral sources have shared with us, so it's very personal to them. Excellent. Elaritha. Hi, I'm Elaritha Coleman. I own Atlanta Family Law Group in Atlanta, Georgia, and Property Claims Litigation Group also in Atlanta. Two uh, separate law firms, for those of you who are keeping track. Two completely separate firms, two different brands, two different P&Ls. Um, I joined the program in July of 2016. Um, our prior year's revenues to that were 280000 this year we'll land somewhere between 2425. Um, one of the first workshops that I did was the referral workshop in Vegas with Arjun where I brought four potential members. You had to earn your way in. Um, you had to pay a deposit and then you had to get at least I think two or three other potential members to also get to Vegas. Very short turnaround. Um, just to say how far removed I am from that person, I flew spirit to Vegas to get from there. From Atlanta. Um, so yeah, uh, but the exercise of getting those people in that room um, really put me on a platform of influence in a lot of the lawyer Facebook groups. I met a tremendous amount of attorneys from all across the country. I not only got people in that room, but I also, to the following LQM, got um, five additional people to Discovery Day. Three of those five people I had never met in person. Um, in this room today, um, Brittany Holmes is a new member, Rosalind Johnson is a new member. I met Rosalind for the first time maybe two weeks ago in person. Um, Brittany I met in person for the first time, what day is it, Saturday? Friday. Um, I get referrals from all over the country of people I've never laid personal eyes on because of what I learned in getting the people into the room at that referral workshop. Jeff? Hey, I'm uh, Jeff Hodson. I'm the owner of Family First Firm in uh, Central Florida. We are an elder law firm. Um, I joined How to Manage in, let's see, it was 2019. And in 2018, we had done, let me see here, uh, about 1.7. This year, we're gonna break, uh, do a little over 4 million, and we spend absolutely nothing electronically. Um, so, you know, no Facebook, no pay-per-click, none of that. So we're doing about four million on basically referrals and then having to Google my business page. That's about it. Excellent. <laughs> Eric up for a second round? Uh, q and I'm oh, sorry? I'm up for Q&A. Okay, uh, before that, is there any, okay, before we get to q and I just wanna, what's that? Go. I'm Marie Drake owner of the Drake Law Firm. We specialize in no bullshit divorces. And after I took the Bob Berg seminar in March of 2020, I went back to Denver and I started, I mean, I'd been intermittently writing handwritten thank you notes my whole career. But I just started writing them every week. I set aside time on Fridays. I just spent 30 minutes. I'm a photographer, so I made some, had my VA make some nice cards, put the logo on the back, started sending them out every single week to someone. Sometimes it was one, sometimes it was 10, and um, it was always, always, always to someone who referred a case, but I also sent them to clients just to say, hang in there, we're closing in on the last stretch. I know this trial prep is hard, but we're thinking about you and we're all on the same team. 
and guess what? Um, I got more calls from lawyers and clients saying thank you because they had never in their whole fucking life received a handwritten thank you note. Never. It was so weird. Anyway, but just do it. Just set aside, like it takes no time. And my firm numbers I talked about on this morning, like they're, it's proof in the pudding. Thank you. All right. <coughs> you guys want me to add? Yep. Uh, Brett Harrison, Long Island, New York. I joined in January 2020. I was about 1, 1 1.1, and now I'm at 1.9 already this year. And that's about, I'm already up, I think, 83%. And part of that, I think, was being able to commit and listening to the Friday and a lot of time the Wednesdays when you guys do different talks and different questionnaires, whether it be our John or his staff. You might not always talk and you want to talk, but somebody a lot of times will ask a question and you learn a lot from it. And I think I'd even be higher doing maybe 20% more, if not 30%, had I started to do more of these uh, thank you notes because so much of my business comes from referral sources. So I'm, I'm projecting out in three years to be about 6.2. All right, now I'd like to invite everyone whose revenues are under $250,000 to stand up. Revenues under $250,000 to stand up. Don't be shy. And then at your option, you can go to the microphone and share your excuse for why you can't do this. No takers? No? You got one? Oh. So my excuse is actually very simple. It's, I think I can't do it. I don't, I don't know, is that an excuse? Does that technically qualify as, as an excuse? Hold on, wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait. Wait, that might be a reason. I have I... other reasons, I have other, I have a list if you want, but. Oh, hold on. I think it sums up. Dictionary.com, excuse, excuse, excuse. Uh, to serve as an apology or justification for, to release from an obligation or duty. Okay, that's an excuse. <laughs> it's a sad and pathetic one, but it's an excuse. So I know, what, I know, so, I so, admit. So let's, so let's talk this through. Okay. What, so there's three things that are really, there's three fundamental pieces of this automatic referral machine, right? Mm -hmm. One is having a conversation with all of your clients at the end of their case or matter to demonstrate to them that you care and let them know what to expect to come next because it's their first time opening a business, closing a business, buying a business, starting a business, reaching a certain milestone in a business, but you presumably have seen this happen many, many, many times before. That's why you're the professional. What part of that do you think you can't do? Okay, let me, re let me rethink that then. Um, or I'm sorry, to rephrase. I have tried many things and I have failed. So it's not that I think I can't physically do it, but when I try, fail, try, fail, why bother? I put an effort, I don't see results. So what I guess I say when I think I can't do it, not so much I can't do the actual work, but I, can't, I won't see the results. So you basically are telling all of these people with million dollar firms that they're all a bunch of idiots. No, and I I'm an idiot too, because we're all telling you this works. No, I think I'm the exception to. Oh, you're a special <laughs> snowflake. I'm, I'm the idiot. You're a special snowflake. I'm the idiot. You're a special <laughs> snowflake. 
Why will it work for everyone else, but it won't work for you? I don't have a good answer except. Except I know, what? It's mindset issues. I except you're special. Not in a good way. <laughs> yes, but I'm. I'm specially. I'm. Uh, I don't know. I'm just good at being a failure. Because <laughs> what? I'm just good at failing. What are you talking about? No, she just told you she's good at failing. What are your revenues going to be this year? I don't want to say, but Sorry? less than two. Less than two fifty. And how long have you been at it for? It's complicated, but let's say three years. What's complicated about it? I had kids, so I didn't. I can't say honestly oh. that I worked in oh, my you're, firm. You're, wait, wait. So you weren't working full time? Right. Okay, so, so you yeah. weren't working full time. So for three years you weren't working full time, and you built a firm to two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Like one twenty, yeah. All right, I'm just gonna make a guess. I'm gonna make a guess that you're very comfortable in the role of the ne'er-do-well underdog in your family. I'm not sure I understand. Can you rephrase? Um, if you were to show up with a million dollar business, <coughs> excuse me, if you were to show up with a million dollar business, let's say 24 months from now, you would, it would disrupt a bunch of relationships that you have with friends and family. No, it would not. Do you want me to explain why? It would disrupt the nature of the relationships you have with friends and family. No, I come from an affluent community with a lot of very successful professionals. I, that's got nothing so, to do with anything. Uh, maybe I'm not understanding, but it doesn't, it's not unusual, I guess. It wouldn't be seen as, some, I don't think so, not with my family at least. You didn't say that it was unusual for people in your okay. community or in your family to be very successful. I am saying that you don't play that role in your relationships. Okay. I, I mean, I'm telling you this. It's sure. very obvious. It's okay. like I, I can tell you you're wearing a dark jacket or a dark blouse. You're wearing something on your head. You're standing at a microphone. You're standing in Seattle. The relationships you have with your friends and family are such that you play this role and they accept you in this role. Okay, I see now. Like I'm, I'm the helper, if that makes sense? If, that's, that, the, if, that's, okay. the, if that's the version of the role, sure. sure. But the, the role that you're in is the role you play in the relationships with your friends and family. They accept you in that role. Okay. And you are comfortable being in that role because that's the role you are familiar with. Okay. And were you to show up with a million dollar business and a quarter million dollar personal income and you were living in a million dollar house, excuse me, a $750,000 house, wait, you're this, okay. And you were gonna be living in a whatever, million dollar house and driving the car of your choice and having domestic servants and flying first class and not doing your own laundry and not scrubbing your own toilets and not eating at you know Denny's you know to celebrate and whatever 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 and you suddenly showed up as that version of yourself that would disrupt the relationships you have because you wouldn't be playing the agreed role in your family and in those relationships okay you understand what I'm saying I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not really, I'm not really, I'm having a hard time conceptualizing. All right. Yeah. Your friends and your family accept you in the role of the broke loser. I don't think so. You just no. told me so. No. The I, words just came out of your mouth. Th that's me, that's how I feel, but. Your friends and your family accept you in this role. They accept you as the person who drives the car that you drive, making less than $120,000 a year gross revenue. Mm -hmm. They accept you in the role of the person who lives in the house you live in, making less than $120,000 a year gross revenue. 
They accept you as the person wearing the clothes that you wear with a law firm grossing less than $120,000 gross revenue. They accept you as the person who says you can't do the things you say you can't do because your revenues are less than $120,000 gross revenue. They accept you as the person who does the things you say you have to do because your revenues are only grossing less than $120,000 gross revenue. They accept you as the person who makes the choices you make. They accept the choices you make. They accept the decisions you make that you, that you, that you make. And they support you in these choices and they support you in these decisions as the person who's, who's making the decisions from the place of a person whose business is grossing less than $120,000 a year. True statement? I know it's a true statement. It's okay. not a question. It, okay. It's obviously, it's yeah. ob do you, listen, we're not having an argument. Sure. I'm, it's obviously a true statement. You know okay. how we know it's a true statement? Mm -hmm. Because that's where you're coming from with all of your choices and all of your decisions, right? Okay, yeah. Yes? And your friends still are friends with you. Okay, I misunderstood your, when you said accept. And your family okay. still you know, speaks to you. Right, okay. Right? If you started using illicit drugs, would some of your friends intervene and tell you, hey, you got to get your shit together, you got to stop using drugs? Yes. If, if you started drinking and carousing and doing drugs and staying out late at night and doing all, all those kinds of things, would your friends and family lay down the law and say, this is not acceptable? Yes. Okay, and if you said, I'm going to do it anyway, would they continue to be your friends and hang out with you? Would they continue to support you? Or would they eventually distance themselves from you because you're not behaving in a way that's acceptable in their, in their, in their fabric of society? Probably distance, well, depends on who, but I guess most of my friends would probably distance themselves. All of your friends would distance themselves, and all of your family would too. They would either demand that you shape up and live within the norms of your, of your group, mm -hmm. or they would eject you from the group. That's how social groups work. You get what I'm saying? Yes. And so when you tell me that your revenues are under $120,000 a year, I know you're making decisions based on, I only have $120,000 a year in revenue. I know you're making excuses about what you'd like to be doing, but you can't be doing because I only have $120,000 a year in revenue. I know you're saying I have to do these things that I have to do because I only have $120,000 in revenue. And I know you're saying I can't do the things that I want to do because I only have $120,000 in revenue. Right? Right. And they accept all these explanations. True? Yes. Because if they didn't accept these explanations, they would either demand that you get your shit together and raise your revenues, or they would eject you from the group. Yes. They would leave you behind. Not because they don't love you, but they would just not accept you in the group anymore. Okay. Yes? Yes. There's a range of behavior that's acceptable within every social group. And you have a role in your social group as the person who lives this way. And everyone accepts you as the person who lives this way, as evidenced by the fact that you're still friends with your friends and hanging out with your family and doing all that kind of stuff. You get what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not telling you anything that isn't obvious. These are just how it is. Okay. And now you're going to show up and all of a sudden you're no longer the person who can't do the things that you can't do because your revenues are only $120,000 a year. And you're no longer the person who has to do the things you have to do because your revenues are only $120,000 a year. And you're no longer the person living in the house you're living in because your revenues are only $120,000 a year. And you're no longer the person eating the food, dressing the clothes, driving the car, with the, whatever, based on that level of revenue. Mm -hmm. You now show up as a person with a million dollars in revenue, which now means you're no longer uh, willing to do the things you used to be willing to do. Okay. You're no longer willing to forego doing the things that you used to be willing to forego doing. You're no longer willing to drive the car. You're no longer willing to scrub the toilet. You're no longer eat at the restaurant. You're no longer willing to wear the clothes. You're no longer willing to put up with the shit you used to be willing to put up with that everyone in your friends and family accepts that you put up with. Okay. You get that? Yes. Do you have children? Three, yes. 
okay, imagine what would happen if you showed up to your next get together with your friends or family. And I'm not saying this to be funny, so don't laugh. I'm completely serious about this. And I'm not trying to scare you, so just, just imagine this. Imagine you showed up uh, at your next family, friend get together, and they say, hey, how are your three children? And you say, I don't have three children. What do you mean you don't have three children? I only have two children. How is this going to go over? I think people would think I'm nuts. <laughs> okay. Well, well, let's go the other direction. I don't have three children. I have four children. <coughs> that I've been lying to them. Like hiding a kid, I guess. <laughs> I, 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 just, I, just, I just had a child last week. Okay. What are your friends and your family and everyone going to say? Oh, they congratulate me. What? I think they congratulate me. Maybe yeah, that's the first thing they're going to say. <laughs> Maybe I'm not understanding the question, like they didn't know I was pregnant. Where the hell did this kid come from? <laughs> okay. You've been pregnant for nine months and you never mentioned it to anyone? Okay. That's what they're going to say, right? Yes. I'm trying to help you appreciate what I started the day talking about. And by the way, I want to congratulate you for having the courage to talk about this. <laughs> and I'm going to ask everyone in the room who I've had basically materially the exact same conversation with to please stand up. And I promise you, there's a lot more people I've had the same conversation with. They just don't recognize it was the same conversation. <laughs> All right? The reason that the people who have a $100,000 firm have a $100,000 firm and not a $200,000 firm is because their identity is all wrapped up together with being the owner of a $100,000 firm. And the reason why the people with a $200,000 firm have a $200,000 firm is because their identity is all connected up with being the owner of a $200,000 firm. And the reason why the people with a $500,000 firm, you see where I'm going with this? Yes. Um, where's the flip chart? Viviana. Bring me the flip chart, please. Right there. I need someone with a calculator. Just bring the chart and then the markers. Give me the chart, go back to the markers. Thank you. Where do you need it? That's good? All right. So, firm A will be in black. Firm A will be in blue. Firm B will be in red. There is no significance to these color choices. Got it? I've chosen these colors because I think they will stand out best on the camera given the lighting conditions <laughs> of the room. There's no hidden messages. <laughs> it's just colors, all right? A room full of lawyers. What does the color mean? It means nothing. All right. Sorry? Mm. $100,000. $100,000. Year, year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll just go to year eight because I ran out of paper. Okay? $100,000 firm grows at 5% per year. So $100,000 times 1.05. 
times 1.05. How much? 110,000. Yeah, I'm just going to round it off. Year, th year four? 115,700. Year five? 121,000. Year six? $127,000. Year seven? $134,000. And year eight? $140,000. You with me? And let's just say, just to make this simple, that there's one associate per $100,000. Okay? There's one staff person per $100,000. You got it? So this firm has staff of how much? How much staff? One. How much staff? How much staff? How much staff? How much staff? Here, let's just say one, and they have a part-timer, and one and a part-timer. You with me? Got it? What kind of policies and procedures do you need to manage one person? Not much, right? Now you have a firm where the owner writes a business plan, makes a marketing plan, figures out a sales system, documents some processes and systems and procedures so they can hire, train, manage, and make a profit with staff, puts some financial controls in place, you know, runs the law firm like a real business, right? Someone, just everyone call out the percentage of growth that you all experience. 30, 100, 200, 300, 50, let's just say 50%, okay? Does that seem like a reasonable number for the room? Yeah? Year over year. Okay. So 100 times 1.50 is how much in year two? $150,000. Year three? 225. Year four? How much? 337. Year five, let's call it 500,000. Year six, 750,000. Year seven, 1.4 million. And year eight, 1.7 million. Now what I want you to notice is that earlier when we had two long lines of people who had multi-million dollar firms, Every one of them grew their firm a lot faster than this. So this is actually a pretty conservative, relatively modest rate of growth. You with me? You with me? So how many staff do we have here? 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 Seven. Eleven. And 17 staff. What kind of policies and systems and procedures do you need when you've got two staff relative to one staff? It's exponentially more. You get what I'm saying? And then three, and then five, and then seven, and then 11, and then 17. By the way, how much turnover do you have when you've got one trusty staff person for seven years? None. Well, you got like one person besides yourself, maybe, right? That one person is your rock, and you lean on them, and your buddies in the trenches, and right? And if that person quits 
or you have to fire them. It's like drama all over the place, right? You with me? What kind, of sta- what kind of turnover do you have when you've got five staff? I mean, you're turning over two people a year. What kind of turnover do you have when you've got 17 employees? I mean, it's like almost every other month you're replacing someone. What kind of drama is there when someone leaves the firm when you've got 10, 12, 15 employees? Zero. All right. Pick another area of your life that we can examine as it relates to a $100,000 firm that grows to a $140,000 firm versus a $100,000 firm that grows to a $2 million firm. Because every single part of your life is going to change really, really, really fast. It took this firm, it took this owner eight years, eight years to get to $140,000. That's, you know how that feels? It feels comfortable. It feels like a nice, comfortable, warm blanket. It does. Everything's familiar. Nothing changes. Everything's the same. Everything's predictable. You don't have to grow personally very much. You don't have to change your relationship with staff at all because you're working with the same person the whole time. You don't have to change your relationship with your friends and your family because you're living the same, you're living in the same house, you're living in the same neighborhood, your kids are going to the same school with the same kids, you're friends with the same parents. Everything's the same for your whole life here. Your revenues go from 100,000 to 225,000 in 24 months. Are you still living in the same house? Are you Okay, your revenues go from 100,000 to 500,000. Are you still living in the same You're you're changing your house. You're changing your vacations. You're having to learn to manage and relate to people in a completely different way. You're taking different vacations. You're eating at different restaurants. Your kids are going to better schools. Now you're having to make friends with new parents whose kids go to the better schools. Everything in your life is changing really, 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 really fast, and it's uncomfortable. You get that? And all of a sudden, your friends who knew you as this person... They meet a whole new person every year. They meet a person with a whole new set of priorities every year. They meet a person with a whole new set of options every year. They meet a person with a whole new set of problems every year. They meet a person with a whole new set of standards every year. And How do you think that feels to your friends and your family to have to relearn your standards and relearn your options and relearn your priorities and relearn your address almost every year? Is that comfortable for them? No. No. It's uncomfortable for them. This, by the way, is what the practical, profitable mindset program is all about that we're doing next year. So if anyone is really serious about having this kind of change in your life, that's something that I would very highly recommend you do. And we capped it at 100, but then Renee basically kicked our ass and said we have to let more people in. And by the way, the price is going to go up after this live quarterly meeting. Everyone who's in the Practical Profitable Mindset, we did a bonus session a few weeks ago. How was that? We're going to do another bonus session before the end of this year, and then we're going to kick it off in January, and the price is going to go up. So go do that now. All right. No, 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 we're not done. We're not done. Okay. So you said you can't grow, you can't do this. Yes. And the reason you said you think you can't do it is because you think it won't work for you 
or because you think it will work for you and it'll be really uncomfortable if it does? Combination of both. <laughs> okay, why won't it work for you? Do the people you do business with not value and appreciate relationships? I, don't, I honestly don't know the answer. I, I, I don't know. Well, I think so look, do, I, I have to make a yeah. choice. Here's my choice. My choice is I either have to, remember when I said that I'm committed to giving you love and I'm committed to giving you security and I'm committed to giving you self-esteem and I'm willing to let you dislike me in the process? Okay, I see where this is going. Right. <laughs> Well, this is just like, how old are your kids? Uh, nine, seven, and four. Okay, uh, this is just like when the nine-year-old hates you because you tell the nine-year-old what the nine-year-old doesn't want to hear, right? Yeah. So you're saying things that are very, very, very bad for your future. True. And so I have to make a decision. Am I going to use this opportunity to get love from you, to get security from you, to get self-esteem from you, because I need you to like me, which would be doing you a huge disservice, or am I gonna use this opportunity to help you recognize what you're doing to yourself so you can move past it, so you can have a better future? Yeah, sounds like I'm gonna dislike you now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I didn't come here to like you. <laughs> uh, round of applause. I, I actually didn't hear what she said. Oh, she didn't come here to like me. Good. Uh, round of applause if throughout our journey together at various points you have disliked me a little or a lot. I'm not, I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to be effective. Um, so let's think this through, all right? And by the way, I want to promise you something. I want to promise you that, if, if, that, that there's probably at least 100 people in this room right now who, if they are paying attention, they're translating every part of our conversation to themselves. And then there's everyone else who should be. <laughs> okay? So you're doing this as a service to them, as well as for yourself. Fuck them. Just do it for you. All right? So you're saying things that are total bullshit. Do you recognize that? Yes. Do you know what I mean when I say bullshit? Yes. What is bullshit? Um, that's, I'm, I'm comfortable and I have to stop. What is the truth? That I need to make a lot of changes. No, what is no. truth? Just truth, object, what is a, truth? A, it's facts that are measurable. What if it's not measurable? Is this, could it still be true? Yes. So what is truth? Well, I don't know if truth is real, but... <laughs> A philosophy question. <laughs> you don't know um, if truth is real. What are you talking about? Um, something that's objective. What's truth? Well, I guess. What if, if no one even knows about it? That's what I'm going Is it what we perceive or what's actually, I don't know. What if we can't perceive it? What if we don't even know about it? Mm -hmm. What if there's something going on at the bottom of the ocean that none of us can perceive, that none of us are aware of, that no scientist even knows about? There's no instrument measuring it. We're completely oblivious to it, but it's happening under the ocean. Is it still truth? Yes. Okay, so what is truth? A fact that is? I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, that's okay. what truth is. Okay. Truth is reality. Mm -hmm. Truth is reality. It does not require us to perceive it. It doesn't require us to like it. 
It doesn't require us to even be aware of it. It doesn't require us to measure it. It just is. It's reality. Yes? Yes. Okay. What's a lie? Uh, if we believe something that is not a fact. Okay, everyone sure. who wants us to do the selling from the stage workshop, I want you to pay attention. I'm giving you a lesson on selling from the stage. You should be paying attention to this. I'll start again so you can pay attention again. What's truth? Reality. Reality. See, I do this here. This was truth. I'm going to keep coming back to this spot for truth. When I go to make the sale, that's where I'm going to do it. And you know what I'm going to do when I do it? And you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to the back of the room. And I'm going to tell you, I'm about to go to the spot, and I'm about to stomp three times, and I'll do it, and you're still going to get up and go to the back of the room. That's how powerful this stuff is. Now it's locked in. You can't stop it. What is a lie? The opposite of reality. Is it? I'm not really sure what you're trying to get at, so I'm not sure how to answer the question. <laughs> so I would argue okay. that a lie is when a person intentionally misrepresents their best perception, their best understanding of reality. Okay. If I perceive um, that I'm wearing blue shoes and I say, hey everyone, I'm wearing red shoes, I've lied to you. Yes? I've, I've misrepresented my best understanding of reality, mm -hmm. okay? What's a mistake? What's a mistake? Uh, an accidental happening, I don't know. A mistake, I would suggest, is when a person has done their best to accurately describe their best perception of reality, but it turns out they're wrong. Okay. I mean, what if I put these shoes in the laundry or something and it turns out that all the blue dye comes off and they're red? Right? Mm -hmm. I thought they were blue. I really believe they were blue. I did my level best to give you an accurate description of my best perception of reality. Turns out I was wrong. I've made a mistake. The, the, the failure to comfortably distinguish between a lie and a mistake holds a lot of entrepreneurs back from tremendous opportunities for growth and success. Because no one wants to be perceived as a liar. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand the difference between a lie and a mistake, it tends to freeze you. You'll get paralyzed. You'll be afraid to make any kind of judgments. You'll be afraid to make any kind of decisions. You'll be afraid to make any kind of commitments. You'll free, be afraid to make any kind of representations to anyone because, oh my God, what if it turns out not to be true and they think I'm a liar? Yes. See, I'm perfectly comfortable making mistakes. I never lie. I make lots of mistakes. The reason why I'm comfortable making mistakes is because I also embrace 100% personal responsibility. And when I make mistakes, I do everything in my power to make it right. People who don't take 100% personal responsibility often have a hard time distinguishing between lies and mistakes. Mm -hmm. Just putting that out there for you all to consider as part of your journey of personal development, okay? So, reality and truth are what? The reality. 
It's real. It's what is. It how, it's how things actually are. Yes? A lie is an intentional misrepresentation of how you think things are. A mistake is an unintentional misrepresentation of how you think things are. Yes? Everyone who's interested in learning how to sell millions of dollars from the stage, you'll notice what I'm doing here. What am I doing? I'm creating a new space. Why am I creating this new space? So I can talk about something bad that I don't want to have associated with myself. That's where the bullshit is. I'm never going to go into that place. That is now the place that is bullshit, and I'm not going to go there on this stage. I've taught you that this is the place where we go for truth. I've taught you that this is where lies are. I've taught you that this is where I've taught you where it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah? And since I'm going to keep going back and forth across the stage, I'm going to say that that's where the bullshit is. What's bullshit? If that's truth, and that's a lie, and that's a mistake, then what's bullshit? A very big lie. No, a lie is a lie. What's okay. bullshit? All right, so there was a book written by a, by a Princeton professor where he actually examines the history of the word bullshit. And he came up with a really good working definition of the word bullshit. And the way that uh, Professor Frankfurter describes bullshit is bullshit is when you make a representation which could be correct, it could not be correct, but the thing that makes it bullshit is you haven't thought it through. You haven't analyzed it. You haven't figured it out. You just say it without really thinking it all through. It's bullshit. You get what I'm saying? Which do you think is more dangerous? A liar or a bullshitter? A liar or a bullshitter? A bullshitter. <laughs> Why is a bullshitter more dangerous than a liar? Because a liar, at least they've thought it through. It's more intentional, whereas... At least a liar knows what the truth is. Yeah. A bullshitter is like a loose cannon. A bullshitter is completely reckless and out of control. They don't know what's real. They don't know what's not real. They don't know what's going on. They're reckless and dangerous. Yes? And so when I say to you that you're talking a bunch of bullshit, I mean you're saying things that I don't believe you've really thought through. So you've made a representation that this won't work for you. Now, is this not going to work for you because you've tested it in reality? There's people who are like fighting the urge as I do this to get up and run to the back of the room. There's other people. There's other people. Is it, is it reality? Have we tested this? Have we analyzed this? Have we investigated this? Have we measured this? Have we really thought it through and figured it out? So it's real? Or do you know that that's not real and you're intentionally misrepresenting the truth and you're lying to us? Or have you really thought it all the way through? You really figured it out. You really analyzed it a lot. And you're making your best representation of how you think things are. And it's possible that you might just be making a mistake. Or have you not really thought it all the way through? You haven't really investigated it. You haven't really analyzed it. You haven't really figured it out. And you're just saying it anyway. Because you think it's going to get you through the conversation. I don't know, you tell me. Um, I think it's a combination or something between, maybe I haven't measured, I haven't, in part because I don't know how, which is why I'm here. That's okay. Um, 
some things I have tried, but maybe I did, I did them imperfectly or I didn't know what I was doing or I even know how to measure it. Um, so I think that's the best answer I can give you. Well, you said you can't do this. I can't do it. Is that truth? Is that a lie? Is it a mistake? Or is it bullshit? No, when I clarified it so that it won't, like, if, like, when I can't do it is that I can't, I won't see the results. So, and like, because I'm the special snowflake. <laughs> do you believe you're a special snowflake because you think that's reality? Do you believe you're, are you saying you're a special snowflake and you're lying to us and you know that it's not reality? Do you really believe that you're a special snowflake and if we can prove to you you're not, then you'll realize you just made a mistake or you're just trying to bullshit all of us and think that being a special snowflake will let you off the hook and will excuse you from doing the things that the rest of us know you could be doing to improve your life. I think it's a mistake, but I want to be wrong in the sense that You want to be I, wrong? Yeah. Okay. I want well, then, this is a really easy way for you to do this. You know what it's called? Trying harder? <laughs> you don't even have to try harder, because you apparently haven't tried at all. No, I have. I mean, I haven't tried this, but I've tried writing thank you cards, sending gifts to my clients, um, networking, but I must be doing it incorrectly, I think. So do you have to try harder, or is it possible that maybe you could try less hard, but try differently? Yeah, try differently. So maybe if you try something different, it'll work, and it's not a matter of trying harder. Okay, yes. Because if you start saying try harder, then we get into the whole conversation about but I value my relationship with my kids and I'm not willing to sacrifice my relationship with my kids to work harder and I'm not willing to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week because I love my kids and people who love their kids shouldn't have to work that hard and that's why, and there's a bunch of fucking bullshit that follows that. Right. Right? Because what you've seen over and over and over and over and over today and yesterday too, by the way, was hundreds and hundreds of people standing up and telling you and sharing their stories about getting better results working less hard by doing things differently than they used to do them. Yes. So maybe it's time to try doing things differently. Yes, that's why I'm here. Good. So then you can write the thank you notes the way that we're asking you to write the thank you notes. Yeah? Yes. And you can organize the networking events the way that we're asking you to organize the networking events. Yes. Right? And you can, um, I'm totally blanking on the third thing. <laughs> and you, and, you can, and yes. you can have conversations with all of your clients at the conclusion or at an appropriate milestone of the representation to guide them and offer guidance about what comes next. Yes. And if it works for like everyone else, but it doesn't work for you, then maybe the thing to do is just tweak it a little bit and tweak it a little bit and tweak it a little bit. Unfortunately, you don't have to be alone because you can go on to the membership forum and you can say, I've been trying this this way. Does anyone have a suggestion for how I can tweak and do it differently? And you have a practice management advisor and you can say, hey, this isn't working for me this way. Can you recommend for how I can do it differently? I mean, you have resources now. Mm -hmm. You're not all alone. Yes. Okay? But this still doesn't resolve the issue of what's going to happen when you show up a year from now with like a 250000 $350,000 firm and a lot less excuses for why you can't, why you don't, why you do, why you must, why you have to, that your friends and your family accept today. Actually, I'm going to say that I think if there's a relationship that I'm going to disrupt, it's not with my friends and family, it's with myself. Good. Well, I will love to watch that happen. <laughs> Me too. <laughs>